Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 110 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and compare them to their real life fossil counterparts and today you can see we've got a whole bunch of African animals today mostly African ungulates with a couple other things mixed in so I think you guys are going to be very very happy with that if you guys love your African ungulates and love African things in general you're going to have a bit of a field day today. So we're going to be starting off with the Nasala or Nasala Land Wildebeest by Phonetic Leaf and Gen. Really, really awesome mod that we've got going on here. So the Nasala Wildebeest, they're one of the subspecies of Wildebeest. I believe their name is uh, John Stoney. I believe that's their scientific name. Uh, we, can, we can actually check. We could probably check in the uh, Zoopedia. Yep, there's John Stoney. See, so yeah, I was correct. So, these guys aren't too different from other wildebeests, but they are the smallest kind of subspecies of wildebeest. And where they live now is predominantly around places like southern Tanzania and northern Mozambique. And they were once present in Malawi, where they get the name Nasala Land, because that's what Malawi knew to, used to be named as. But that's where it's got its subspecies name. But sadly, they're now extinct there because of conflicts and hunting and things like that. Um, you can see they're, they're typically more brownish uh, than other wildebeest, and as I mentioned, a bit smaller. And on their coats, more brownish. And they have hair on their manes, they're somewhat widgeted and stick up in the air like that. And they have a pet population that's estimated to be about 50,000 to 75,000. So they are doing okay, and they're a regional subspecies. Let's see what other information we can get. Uh, talk about so look you can see their range there uh, so there's about two-thirds live in the eastern part yep yeah most of this is kind of the same but yeah really really awesome not too different and we can have a look at the cute little baby where's the cute little baby uh, there is the cute little baby little cute little cutie so yeah really awesome to get the nasala wildebeest next up we have got uh this one was done by Phonetic Leaf and Gen. Next up, we've got the Lynchenstein Hearter Beast, which was done by Leaf, uh, Mark, and Mikey NJ. I believe you say that. We've got a wonderful guy here. So, the Lynchenstein uh, uh, Hearter Beast. These guys are a subspecies of the Hearter Beast antelope that dwell in savannah and uh, floodplains in southeastern and central Africa. And they're sometimes considered their own species, uh, Stigmaceras uh, Lynchensteini. Which is very possible because of taxonomy, especially with harder beasts. Sometimes all subspecies are just their own species. It's kind of not really been looked into much. But they get their name from the zoologist Martin Lynchenstein. Which is quite interesting. Oh, that looks like a bit of a bug there, but that's okay. They typically stand at about 1.25 meters, or about 4 foot 1, at the shoulder. And mass at about 150 kilograms, or about 330 pounds. And you can see they've got this reddish brown color, and also the um, lighter on the underbelly as well. They also have horns that are uh, for both sexes, from side to side, that kind of give them an S shape. As you can kind of see that, that looks like an S. And it appears to be front uh, with an O in the upper proportions, things like that. It makes it O. And they've got these ridges on their horns, and they can measure over about 1.6 feet, or about half a meter in length. So pretty cool. In terms of behavior, not too different from most other... Uh, how to beast. These guys uh, live in areas where they eat grasses, uh, where they eat grass, and also diurnal, so they're active during the day. Often uh, they gather in herds of up to about 5 to 15 females with calves and a single male, uh, which leads them. And then the males will stand uh, sentry uh, duty uh, and on termite mounds and the like. And males um, sometimes hold large territories where they mark with digging up soil and things like that. And um, they also have quite good eyesight but a poor sense of smell. And they also make these really interesting sounds that smell more like bellows and things like that. This is the male over here. We'll have a look at you. Yeah, really, really interesting. He's a bit banged up. As I mentioned, they travel in herds. They could be 1 to 10 individuals, so about 1 to 10. Though herds comprised of more than 10 individuals can happen, but they sell them. The highest numbers of uh, congregating you'll see around August, September. And the exact reason is unknown, but this is primarily when most babies are born. It could be for protection, things like that. And um, bachelor males can often be found alone, countering the herd mentality. And bachelor bulls do not establish territories, or solitary bulls will exclude others from their domain. And typically the male to female ratio is 1 to 2.37. 
And these guys are quite territorial mammals, and there's no overlap with the territories between bulls. And the rutting period, or the breeding season, typically runs from uh, mid-October to January, although there's slight variations exist within their range because of locations. And bachelor bulls will often ca uh, challenge alpha bulls until the point of complete exhaustion to take over the resident females uh, of the territory. And there's a number of stereotype behaviors uh, in the repertoire of the genus of... Um, Altipus, Alcipus, uh, if you say that, which is associated with like territorial displays, things like that. We'll have a look at the babies while we uh, talk about it. Oh, this one's kind of a little bit... Yeah, I don't know what's up with that. It must be a bug. Kind of normal for bugs. We'll have a look at you like that. There you are. So, um, off among these, they will like pull the ground and then they'll hold, uh, and homing the earth is the most conspicuous. And in Zimbabwe, they'll often like use head to flank where their head is rubbed against the shoulder and head flagging movement where they shook their head and up and down vigorously when they're alarmed. And they mark their territory with uh, dung piles and things like that, very similar to other subspecies of hartebees. Yeah, really, really cool. Definitely a big fan of these guys. Another great mod done by Leaf, Mark, and Mikey NJ. Next up, we've got a remake of a mod. We have got the Arabian Oryx, a really, really cool animal. Let's have a look at these wonderful guys. So let's have a look at you. Nice to see a good remaster coming in. So uh, the Arabian Oryx, also known as the White Oryx, these are a medium-sized antelope with a distinct uh, shoulder bump and these long, straight horns with a tough tail. And they are the smallest member of the Oryx genus, which is quite interesting. And they're native to the desert and steppe areas of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, they went, and we'll talk about their conservation story, they've got a very interesting conservation story. So in terms of their anatomy, they stand at a between 2.6 and 4.1 uh, feet tall at the shoulder and typically weigh between 240, uh, 220 to 260 pounds or between 100 to 209 kilograms. And the coat you can see is almost completely white except for their undersides and legs that are brown and they have black stripes on their head where they meet the neck. And they also have these quite long horns, which has actually led to the uh, myth of the unicorn, because if you look at them side on, you'll often think there's just one horn, so it's pretty much a unicorn. And um, these long horns can get to about 2 to 4 foot 9, uh, 4.9 feet, or about 60 to 150 centimeters long, so quite big. And um, typically they will rest during the heat of the day, and they can detect rainfall and move towards it, uh, meaning they have these huge ranges, with a herd of Oman having a range of over 3,000 square kilometers. And packs are usually of mis mixed sex, but they usually came between 2 to 15 individuals. The herds of up to 100 have been reported. Arabian oryxes are actually generally not so aggressive towards each other, and which allows the herds to exist peacefully. And other than humans, typically the only predator within their range are wolves, and uh, in captivity and safe conditions, they can have a lifespan of up to 20 years. And in a period of drought, their life expensity may be significantly reduced due to malnutrition and dehydration. And other causes of death can be fights between males, diseases, snake bites, and drowning during floods. So historically, as we'll get into, these guys had a very wide range. Historically, they probably ranged across the Middle East. And in the 1800s, they could be still seen in Palestine. Transjordan and Iraq, the Arabian Peninsula and Sinai, but during the early 20th century their range was pushed back to about Saudi Arabia and by 1914 only a few survived out the country, with a few being reported in Jordan to the 1930s and mid uh, 1930s this population was pretty much considered extinct. In between the 1930s, um, Arabian princes and oil companies, clerks, basically just shot them down en masse with rifles. We had these hunts growing in sides with having like 300 vehicles within these. And the, most of the northern population was pretty much rendered extinct at that time. And the last uh, um, oryx in the wild before their reintroduction was in 1972. So that's pretty sad about them. And they typically prefer areas with gravel uh, deserts or hard sands, where their speed endurance will protect them from most predators and hunters on foot. But in the sandy deserts of Saudi Arabia, they tend to uh, look, walk along the ridges and things like that. They tend to like the flats and things like that. Though typically... Um, Arabian oryxes have been reintroduced to a lot of areas where they used to live, such as Oman, Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United Emirates, uh, Syria, and Jordan, with a small population was introduced to the Hattor Island of Bahrain, with a large semi-managed uh, semi population within several sites within Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. With a total population, uh, the reintroduced is now estimated to be about 1,000. This puts them well over the threshold for the 250 mature individuals to qualify for endangered status, so they're doing quite well considering their uh, reintroduction. So 
pretty good. Really, really good. So in terms of their diet, these guys typically uh, feed on grasses, but they will feed on herbs, fruits, fruits tubers, things like that. And herds will often uh, follow infrequent rains to eat the new plants that grow after these rains. And they can go for several weeks without water. And researchers of Man shows that these typically the grass of the genus Diptogorus is taken with flowers and things like that because they have high water content, so they prefer that. And in terms of their behavior, when they're not wandering around or... Um, Habits that are eating, they'll often dig shallow depressions under shrubs and trees when resting, and they can detect rainfall from a distance and follow it to fresh uh, growth. And the number of individuals in a herd can vary greatly, as I mentioned, things like that. They often will maintain uh, visual contact with other herd members, with subordinate males taking positions between the main body of the herd and the outlying females. And if separated, males will go search for areas where the herds last visited, seeking settling into a, a solitary existence until the herds return. And um, when water and grazing conditions permit, males will establish territories, with bachelor males being solitary, and a dominance hierarchy is created within the herd by posturing displays, which can often uh, be quite serious in terms of injuries, so they have long shark horn horns and things like that. And males and females will use their large horns to defend themselves from interlopers and other, um, other things like that, so pretty, quite cool. In terms of their adaptations, they've got many different adaptations to the uh, desert environments. They have a minimal fasting rate me mechanism, uh, metabolic rate that allows them to uh, pretty much slow down so they don't need as much food. And they let their body temperature rise during the day and they use less evaporant cooling to retain more body temperature. And at night, the cool air uh, lowers the temperature back to its normal range. So they basically let themselves heat up. And they also have... Uh, Arterial body temperature is partly powered by the um, arterial vessels around the heart and allows heat exchange between warmer and cooler blood in the nose, which allows them to help them cool down as well. And um, a lot of other adaptations like that, they've got larger kidneys to reduce the amount of urine that they produce, so that saves water as well, which is quite interesting. And it's important to humans, they're national animals of many places, such as Jordan, Bahrain, and Qatar, things like that, and have uh, been names for... Uh, many businesses, things like that, and as I mentioned, believed to be the original uh, unicorn myth as well. And in terms of conservation, there are lots of people breeding them. As I mentioned, they did go extinct uh, in their range, they're about 1970s, but luckily now they're doing quite well. So there's lots of zoos breeding them. There's the Arabian Oryx sanct uh, Sanctuary, uh, which was set up in 2007 uh, to help protect the species. And they, after they hunted extinction, they were reintroduced uh, with uh, zo zoos and private people really helping. And they've actually one of the first animals to go from extinct to the wild to vulnerable. So that shows how well their populations are doing now. And a really nice comeback for the Arabian Oryx. Really, really awesome. So, awesome. This one was done by Leaf and Phonetic. They really did a wonderful job with the Arabian Oryx. Next up, we have got... This one's done by Just Phonetic himself. We have got the... Impala. So the Impala, these guys are a medium-sized antelope, typically found around eastern and southern Africa. And the only member of the genus Aepcaris, and the last one uh, lived, living. And there's two subspecies, the common Impala, or called the Kenyan Impala, and the um, black-faced Impala, which is not in here, but um, really cool. So in terms of the description, they're quite a slender bodied antelope, as you can see here, comparable to like Grant's gazelle or the cob and things like that. They have a head to body length of about 130 centimeters or 51 inches, with males reaching about 75 to 92 centimeters or about 30 to 36 inches at the shoulder, with females being about 70 to 85 or 28 to 33 inches at, uh, at the shoulder as well. Males typically a little bit heavier, being between 53 and 76 kilograms, and females about 40 to 53 kilograms or between 117 to 100. 68 pounds and 88 and 117 pounds with sexual dimorphism being present with females being uh, hornless and quite a bit smaller than the males uh, as you can kind of see there so this is definitely male and these horns are quite rigid with these kind of grooves in them and they're hollow at the base and they've got the arc and things like that and they use them to fight against each other things like that so really cool you can also see they've got this very interesting coat they've got like a two-tone coat with a reddish brown kind of on the flanks and then they have it lighter and then they have quite a light um underbelly there and also got a white rump with these uh black bands along them as well so really interesting coloration they've also got sink glands which is covered by the black uh, uh spots on these hind limbs as well so they basically uh, have sink glands as well 
and the sebaceous glands or the sweating glands are around like the forehead and things like that and um these sebaceous glands can be most active during the mating season or those who females have not undergone seasonal changes so that's quite interesting so in terms of the ecology and behavior of these guys we'll have a look at the female while we're uh, walking around so we've had a look at the big male so in terms of their behavior these guys are diurnal so they're mainly active during the day their activity tends to cease during the hot midday period so they're kind of crepuscular but there's also three different types of groups they tend to live in there's the uh ter 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 territorial males the bachelor males or the bachelor herds and female herds with territorial males holding territories where they may form harems of females territories are uh, um, marked with urine and feces and defended against male or juvenile intruders with these bachelor herds you also have they tend to be small about 30 members with uh, individuals maintaining a, maintaining a distance of about 2.5 to 3 meters or 8 to 9 feet from one another with uh, young and old males interacting with uh, interact typically middle-aged males will tend to avoid each other except to spar and female herds are a lot more varied they can range in up to six to a hundred and um they will occupy home ranges of about 80 to 180 hectares or about 200 to 440 hectares and the mother calf bond is actually quite weak compared to a lot of other species typically the juveniles um will uh, leave their mother soon after weaning and juveniles will leave the herds uh, uh, of their mothers and join other herds and um, females will tend to be loose and have no obvious leadership and allo grooming is important for these guys so they tend to greet each other and the only um, ungulate to display self-grooming as well as grooming others which is quite interesting a lot of these social behavior as well as influenced by climate geography such as uh, impala being um, territorial at certain times of year in population in southern africa tend to be only territorial during a few months while in east africa they may actually be uh, relatively minimal despite a, a, pro, a protracted mating season so it really just depends on where they are uh, in terms of that behavior they're also quite an important prey species for many African carnivores, such as cheetahs, leopards, wild dogs, lions, hyenas, crocodiles, and pythons. And to when they get away, they can do these two characteristic leaps where they can jump up to three meters in the air over vegetation and even other impala, covering distances of up to 10 meters or 33 feet in these kind of leaps. And um, they often will also kick as well, and they also strop and then rebounds to kind of potentially kick prey as well, uh, kick um, predators as well. And they leap in uh, a manner of different directions uh, to confuse predators. And at times they may also conceal themselves in vegetation to hide from predators. And they also have quite a loud roar that is like three to, uh, two, one to three loud snorts from the mouth with these grunts. And they t these large uh, roars can be heard from up to two kilometers away. With uh, scent glands, secretions typ typically identify a territorial male. With impalas being sedentary, adult to middle ages in particular, can hold these territories for actually quite a few years. So that's quite interesting. So in terms of diet, these guys are grazers. So they uh, primarily uh, eat grasses, but they will depend on what they eat. They'll often feed also on acacia pods. And they also prefer places close to water sources. So they like uh, areas with succulent vegetation, especially if water is scarce. Uh, analysis of their diet so they eat a lot of monocots and things like that and, and typically the grasses uh, increases significantly after the first rains but after the dry season they kind of uh, they won't eat as much grasses things like that probably just to get more um, uh, water but we can see these wonderful little babies here as we get on to the reproduction they're typically uh, sexually mature at about a year of age, though successful mating generally occurs after about four years of age. Mature males will establish territories and try to gain access to females, and then they fight each other, of course. And um, females can conceive after about a year and a half of um, age, and they um, typically three-week breeding season will last during the end of the wet season, so that's typically in May. And um, gestation lasts about six or seven months, with births generally occurring in the midday, and females will isolate herself when she's in labor. And um, a single calf is typically born and then is often concealed for the first weeks of birth. Then the form will join, join a nursery group, and the calf will suckle for about four to six months and then be forced out of the group. And uh, males will uh, be forced to leave and then join bachelor herds, and the females will stay back. But in terms of rushing, uh, males, when they're breeding, they'll make kind of deep roars let's see if the male will talk about him deep roars and they'll often chase each other and they walk stiffly and display their neck and horns and um when coming across the female the courtship she keeps her distance and then he'll kind of come up and like lick her and things like that and try and obviously woo her and things like that which 
which is quite interesting. But um, in terms of their habitat, these guys do like shade. Uh, they can be found in kind of the ecotone or infras between woodlands and savannas. So like places with uh, lots of cover, like acacia cover, things like that. And actually a study found that a uh, reduction of woodland cover created by sublands by um, African elephants gets actually favored in parlor populations. So that's quite interesting. So they basically make habitats for them. And historical range, they had quite a bit wider range. They uh, sprawled across southern and eastern Africa and remained in, to a great extent in the food, but have dis uh, disappeared in a few places, such as um, Burundi. And um, their range extends from Uganda to Kenya, and they can be found in southern Africa. And even the blackface impala is native to Namibia, which is quite interesting. And in terms of conservation, these guys are considered least concerned. However, the blackface impala is vulnerable, with a less than a thousand in the wild. And that there's no major threats to the common impala, things like poaching and natural calamities can really hurt and decline both subspecies of um, uh, impala, or subspecies of impala. And as of 2008, the population for impala has been estimated for the common impala about 8 uh, million, or is estimated to be about 2 million. Though um, some subspecies think that translocation of um, blackface impala may actually be quite beneficial for their conservation. So quite interesting. So really, really cool animal. Fanatic really did a wonderful job with this guy. So next up, we have got the common eland. Done by Leaf, Mac and Nicholas Line Rider. Another really, really cool animal that I'm excited to talk about. So we'll have a look at you. So the common eland, also known as the southern eland or the eland antelope, these guys are a large savannas and plains antelope found in eastern and southern Africa. So really, really cool animals. So they are spiral horned antelope, as you can see, because their horns are spiral. They're also quite sexually dimorphic, with uh, females being quite a bit smaller than males. And females uh, will weigh between 300 and 600 kilograms, or about 660 to 1,320 pounds and measure about 200 to 280 centimeters or 79 to 110 inches long uh, from the snout to the base of the tail and typically will stand at about 125 to 150 feet centimeters or 49 to 60 inches at the shoulder. Bulls are quite a bit bigger and uh, bulls will weigh about 400 to 942 kilograms or about 882 to uh, just over 2,000 pounds about 240 to 235 centimeters or about 94 to 136 inches from snout to tail and uh, they stand about 150 to 183 centimeters or about 59 to 72 inches at the shoulder with um, uh, the tail also being about 50 to 90 centimeters or about 20 to 35 inches long, which shows how big they can get. They can often get to about a thousand kilograms, uh, up to about a thousand kilograms. So their coat does vary quite a bit during their range as they had distinctive markings like these long stripes as well as them. And they have a rough mane and a little bit of a kind of dewlap there. Which is quite interesting, but there's a little bit of variation, and uh, typically as males age, their coat will become more grey, and uh, things like that. But still really cool. Both sexes, you can see, have these quite uh, large ridges going on here, and the horns are visible as small bubs as newborns. You can see, and then they spiral up. Uh, females typically have their horns is about uh, thicker and shorter. The horns of males are typically thicker and shorter than those of females, with males having horns at about uh, 43 to 66 centimeters are about 17 to 26 inches, with females having horns about 51 to 69 centimeters, or about 20 to 27 inches. And um, they have a tighter spiral as well, with males using their horns to uh, kind of fight during the rutting season and they wrestle, but uh, females will use their horns to protect young. They're also the slowest antelope, with peak speeds of up to 40 kilometers an hour, or about 25 miles per hour. That ties them up quite quickly. However, they can maintain a, a 22 kilometers per hour 14 mile per hour trot indefinitely they're also quite capable of jumping up to two and a half meters or about eight foot twelve from standing and um, they have a, a life expectancy of about 15 to 20 years in captivity with some even living up to about 25 or so years and um, eland herds are typically uh, accompanied by the uh, loud clicking sounds that subject to considerable speculation they also, the weight of animal can be carried on two halves of the hooves that play a part, and the clicking of the sound may actually be them walking. And the sound actually carries for some distance and may actually be a form of communication with these guys. So uh, in terms of taxonomy, these guys are a close relative of the giant eland, which is quite interesting. They're the second largest. So in terms of their habitat, these guys live across the open plains of southern Africa, 
and can be found in the Great Southern African Plateau up to the foothills. So they extend north into Ethiopia and South Sudan and then down from Angola to Namibia and South Africa. And they typically prefer semi-arid areas that contain a lot of shrub-like bushes and things like that. Uh, and grasslands, woodlands, things like that, up to about 15,000 feet or 4,000 meters in altitude. And um, they can live in home ranges of about 200 to 400 square kilometers and uh, for, uh, for males and uh, females. Uh, for ju juveniles and about 50 kilometers for males since males typically live by themselves. Let's have a look at the female while we um, have a break. So in terms of their ecology and behavior, these guys are nomadic and crepuscular. So they eat in the morning and uh, evening and they rest in the shade when it's hot and then they remain in sunlight when cold. They can form herds of up to 500 animals with individual members remaining in the herd for several hours or months with juveniles and mothers tending to form larger herds with males separating and even doing their own thing or even in smaller groups and um, they are quite a uh, communicative species they use scent cues vocalizations and uh, display things and a felchman response even occurs with males uh, uh, primarily in males in uh, in contact with female urine or genitals and things like that and of course, they are the main predators for these guys include animals such as lions, African wild dogs, cheetahs, and spotted hyenas, with juveniles being more vulnerable to than adults to predators. In terms of their diet, these guys are herbivores and browse during drier winters, but they've adapted to grazing during the raining season where grasses are more common and nutritious. They require a high protein diet based on succulent leaves from flowering plants, but will consume lower quality plant material. So they like forbs, trees, subs, things like that. And most of their water is obtained through their food, but they will drink when available, when water is available. As they quickly adjust to the surroundings through the seasonal changes off the causes, they often will change their feeding habits. They also will use horns to break off branches that can be hard for them to reach, which is quite interesting. Um, another cool thing as well, they have quite a few adaptations to allow them to uh, survive in extreme temperatures. So they use uh, peripheral thermal receptors in their skin. They can sense heat and increase or decrease the evaporate cooling as well. They also maintain, maintain a cooler, uh, cooler skin temperature as well. And they use that through um, cutilatinous uh, uh, evaporation that allows them to feel cooler even though their body temperature stays relatively the same. The eelig also is, conserves water by increasing its body temperature. And once they reach across this uh, threshold, an increase in sweating and panting can be observed. And common aliens will also use their fur coats to uh, dissipate ex uh, excess heat as well. They also have that dewlap there, which provides more skin to allow heat to escape and helps with thermoregulation. So in terms of... Uh, Reproduction. Females are about sexually mature at about 15 to 36 months of age, and males are about 4 to 5 months of age. Mating may occur at any time during the year after reaching sexual maturity, but it's most common during the raining season. So uh, males and females will uh, typically young are born in Zambia between July and August, which is pretty much the mating season. And mating will begin when the eland get these uh, kind of plentiful grasses, things like that. Um, and typically the male will kind of find uh, the female and the, usually the female will choose the most dominant and fit male to mate with. Sometimes she runs away from the male, uh, which causes more attention and cause fights between males. And males will usually keep in contact during that mating period. And a dominant male can mate with more than one female. And female uh, has a uh, gestation period of about nine months, so similar to a human, and they give birth to one calf each time. Though typically male and female and juveniles each form uh, small, different social groups, the male groups uh, are the smallest with uh, these members staying together in search of food and water. Female groups are much more larger and they cover greater areas. They transfer, uh, travel the grassy plains to find bushy areas and dry periods. They also have quite a complex linear hierarchy. So the uh, nursery and juvenile is natally formed when the females um, give birth. And after 24 hours delivery, the mother and the calf will join the group. Uh, these calves will befriend in each other and stay back to the nursery group while the mother returns to the female group and the calves will leave the nursery group when they're about two years old and they join a male or female group. So that's quite interesting. So in terms of conservation, they're not considered endangered and they are um, conserved under the uh, United States Endangered Species Act where they are protected. And the world population is estimated to be about 136,000 with populations considered stable or increasing in many places where they're found. Though um, population, however, is gradually declining in a lot of places because of habitat loss and also poaching. And um, they believe to be extinct in Eshwadi and Zimbabwe, but they have been reintroduced there. 
And the IUCN estimates that half of the total population lives in protected areas and about 30% on public lands. So most populations seem to be stable, so that's pretty good. And a couple of cool things about the elands is that they're sometimes farm and hunted for their meat, and in some cases are actually better use than cattle and uh, more suitable to African climates. This has led to a lot of uh, South African farmers actually using eland more than uh, cattle, so that's quite interesting. And in terms of their husbandry, they seem to be uh, mild temperament and seem to be uh, quite easily well to being tamed. And they're used for meat and uh, milk production in Russia and South Africa. Their need for water is quite low, so that helps as well. But they need some grazing and lots of salt licks as well. A female uh, can produce up to 7 kilos or about 15 pounds of milk uh, per day. That is richer than milk fat and cow milk, than cow milk, which is well. And the pleasant tail milk has a butter fat content of about 11 to 17 percent and can be stored for up to eight months of properly prepared compared to several days of cow's milk. So who knows, we might be switching over to Eland. Um, housing common Elands is difficult due, uh, due to their ability to jump over fences as high as three meters or simply break through using their large size. So sometimes though wild Elands can break through and um, mix in with the wild ones as well. And um, they can reproduce in captivity pretty well, but calf survival is low and the young will need to be separated from their mother to ensure health and adequate feeding. Now, husbandry uh, remains uh, requires care because they're generally placid, but they're easily startled and they need a lot of space. So yeah, really, really cool. Definitely a big fan of these elands. So really uh, awesome mod done by Leaf, Mac, and Nicholas Line Rider. So next up, uh, last but second to last but not least, we have got the Eastern Black Rhinoceros. So we, we've seen him again. So this is done by Leaf, Nicholas Line Rider, and Gaboy. So nice to see uh, edit because Gaboy has kind of gone through and changed it up a bit just to make it look a little bit more like a real uh, black rhino. So the black rhinoceros, also known as the black rhino or the hornlip rhino, they're a species of rhino native to Eastern Southern Africa and can be found in a lot of places and even though they're referred to as black rhinos their colors from range from brown to gray and they're the only extant member of the genus dicrase so quite interesting in that regard so in terms of their body size and things like that these guys typically get to about 140 to 180 centimeters or about 55 to 71 inches high at the shoulder and about 3 to 3.75 or 9 to 12 feet in length with an adult typically weighing from 800 to 1400 kilograms or about 1700 to about 3000 pounds with unusually large males getting up to about uh, just under three tons so that's quite interesting or about 6385 pounds and um the cows are usually smaller than the bulls and they typically will have these two horns uh made of carrots on the front of their snout which they often hunted for and they typically get to about 50 centimeters uh, or about 20 inches length. So exceptional examples to get up to about 140 centimeters or about 55 inches. And the longest known black rhino horn being measured is nearly about 1.5 meters uh, long or about 4 foot 9. And um, sometimes a small horn can develop. And the rhino will use these horns for both defense, intimidation, and to get up roots as well. And in terms of size, they're smaller than the white rhino, but they're closer in size to the Javan rhino. And unlike the white rhino, one of the main differences that, that they have is they have this hooked lip, as you can see well in this uh, rebaster, is that what they use to grasp leaves and twigs while they're feeding, while the ri white rhinos have wide lips that they use to uh, eat grasses. So they typically, black rhinos are much more um, uh, prehensile with their lip and able to grab branches and things like that. Typically, um, they can also be distinguished because uh, these guys are smaller, they have a smaller skull, and they have a uh, higher position of the head, they hold their hair much higher because they are browser. And they also have quite a thick skin, uh, not just because they are really good at taking jokes, but because it protects them from thorns and sharp grasses, and also will protect uh, from mites and things like that. And they often will have ox peckers picking up parasites from them as well, but they will may also feed on rhino blood, so that's kind of interesting. They also have, um, it's commonly assumed that uh, black rhinos have poor eyesight and rely more on hearing and smell, but recent studies actually show that they have quite good eyesight, comparable to that of a rabbit, and um, their eyes are quite, uh, not, not their eyes, their ears are quite high, that allows them to detect things, and they have an excellent sense of smell that allows rhinos to detect for predators. So in terms of the prehistoric range, they may have lived up into the Sahara and the eastern deserts up there, but historically they lived across most of southern and eastern Africa from 
but they did not occur in the Congo Basin or the Horn of Africa or Ethiopian Highlands, but they were pretty much found across uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. And um, in West Africa, they were found in Sudan and Niger around Lake Chad. And today they're pretty much restricted to nature reserves that have vanished and have vanished from many countries that they used to live because they were hunted uh, a lot. The remaining population is actually quite highly scattered, but they are doing okay. They are being reduced to places such as Malawi and um, things like that. So they are doing okay in that regard. They are considered critically endangered still, I believe. Yeah, but there are efforts to protect them, of course. And they've been reintroduced to places such as Botswana, where they went extinct in 1992, but reintroduced in 2003. So quite interesting in that regard. In terms of behavior, they're typically considered solitary, except for a mother and a baby. Um, in addition, bulls and cows will have a consort relationship during mating, although uh, sub-adults and young adults will actually will um, kind of have loose ag aggregations. They're also not very territorial, and they often will uh, have territories that intersect other rhinos' territories. And home ranges will vary a lot uh, depending on the availability of food and water. They'll generally have a small home range and larger densities and habitats where there's plenty of food and water. And um, the sex and age of the rhino may actually impact it with... Uh, cows having larger ranges than those of bulls especially when they have a calf and things like that it ranges between uh 2.6 to 100 kilometers depending on where they are and they've been observed uh, to have certain areas where they visit the called houses when they're usually on a high ground level level is quite interesting so um they have a reputation as well for being quite aggressive uh but recent studies have shown um that, oh no that's, i'm reading the wrong thing and they have even been observed to charge uh, tree trunks and termite mounds, but they will fight each other as well, and they're the highest, highest rates of mortal combat recorded of any mammal. So about 50% of male rhinos and 30% of female rhinos will die because of uh, combat-related injuries. Adult rhinos typically will have no natural predators because of their large size and horns, but they may fall prey to crocodiles in extreme circumstances, and calves and sometimes small sub-adults will get preyed upon by lions. So, um... In captivity, these guys will sleep, and they show that males will sleep longer and on average, uh, longer on average than females by nearly double the time. And other factors will play in roles when they decide to sleep. And although they do not sleep any longer activity, they do sleep at different times due to the location and captivity or selection of the park. So it's cool, uh, pretty interesting. And rhinos will actually follow the same trails that elephants will use as they use the foraging areas to watering holes. And they also use smaller trails when they are browsing. And they're quite fast and can run up to about 30, 55 kilometers an hour, about 34 miles per hour when running on their toes. And while let's assume these guys are short-sighted, they actually have much better eyesight. And I've already mentioned that. But um, in terms of their diet, these guys are herbivorous browsers. So they feed on leafy greens, things like that. The optimum habitat for them would be places with lots of shrub density and things like that. But they will eat grasses, but nowhere near as much as uh, uh, white rhino. And they've been known to eat about 220 species of plants. And in terms of communication, they will communicate in several different ways. Let's have a look at the female while we talk about them. So... Females will often uh, spray urine when they're receptive to breeding, and often they'll spray on trees to mark their territory. Uh, defecation as well, they'll poo to mark their territory. And they also have these like uh, screams and uh, things that they'll use as well. And they have quite a well-developed sense of hearing, so that allows them to hear the calls of other rhinos. And in terms of their reproduction and things like that, they're solitary in nature, but they really only come together for mating. They do not have a seasonal pattern for mating, but they tend to give birth to the end of the raining season. And um, when they come into season, the cows will make dung piles and the male bulls will follow the cows until they find her and um, chase off any um, rival bulls and things like that. Courtship will involve snorting and sparring with horns against males and things like that. And then the gestation period for a black rhino is about 15 uh, months and once obviously she's pregnant and then the single calf will be born at about 35 to 50 kilograms or 80 to 110 pounds of birth and can follow its mother just around for just after three days of birth weaning will typically occur at about two years of age uh, for the offspring and the mother and calf will stay together for about two to three years until the next calf is born and um, female calves may stay longer which forms like small family groups and the young will occasionally be taken by hyenas and liners, lions and typically sexual maturity is reached about seven uh, five to seven years uh, of age for females and about seven eight years for males and your life expectancy for natural conditions uh, without poaching or things like that can be about 35 to 50 years in rhinos which is quite interesting 
So in terms of conservation, for most of the 20th century, they were the most numerous rhino around, with the population probably being in the hundreds of thousands. But over time, uh, especially during the later half of the century, uh, 20th century, the population went down to about 70,000, and they reached their lowest point at about 2004, where there was only about t a little over 2,000, about 2,500 uh, black rhinos remaining in the world. But luckily, after some good conservation, by 2009, the population has been estimated to be about 5,500. So a great conservation story, and they seem to be on the up and up. Though they are... Um, even though they are being reintroduced to areas and there's lots of conservation efforts, uh, they are sadly still uh, threats uh, that impact them. So the biggest threats to these guys include changes in the habitat, since they like lots of trees and things. Often they can be cut down for uh, things like that, for like farming. Illegal poaching for their horns, which is demand of Chinese markets because they think rhino horn is like a magical cure for anything, but it's actually just keratin, which is very sad. But... um. Also, uh, some competing species as well. They often will get competed out by um, elephants, for example. Since elephants are both browsers and grazers, they'll even uh, be able to outcompete rhinos in some areas. And they also face a lot of problems such as uh, the minerals they ingest because they uh, tend to be just into eating less iron, which can be a problem in captivity. And illegal poaching is the main threat for these rhinos. They usually are killed for... Um, their horns and also they've been used for their rhino skin to make crowns and things but uh, they've been made for herbalists and they often uh, cure fevers things like that you know how people are with rhino horn but luckily that's something that a lot of people have been really trying to stamp down on people trying to catch poachers and protecting rhinos and it seems to be working because the population is going up so that's a really really awesome sign of the future and i think rhinos are just a really great conservation story so next up Last but certainly not least, so this uh, Eastern Black Rhino was done by Leaf, Nicholas Lion Rider, and Gaboy. Did a wonderful edit to make it look more like a uh, Eastern Black Rhino, or just a Black Rhino. Next up, last but certainly not least, this one's a bit of a handful in terms of names. We have got by uh, uh, Havoc1199, uh, Haruku Ichinos, uh, Gaboy, and Mega Gaming Rex. We have got the African Leopard. So really cool animal here. So the African leopard, or Panthera pandas pandas, these guys are the nominate subspecies of the leopard and they're native to many countries in Africa and is widely distributed across Sub-Saharan Africa and also was not recorded in North Africa, which is the Barbary leopard. So there was originally quite a few different subspecies of African leopard, but they've all been lapped into P. pandas pandas because they all kind of fit within the uh, uh, genetic variety of things. But there have been some clades identified uh, kind of like a Central Southern African clade, West Africa, things like that, which is quite cool. So characteristics, they do have quite a bit of variation in their coat color, which depends on their location and habitat as well. And usually they have a pale to deep, deep gold color, or tawny even, and sometimes even black. And they have these rosettes along their heads, lower limbs, and belly. With uh, In terms of sizes, though, male leopards are typically a bit larger. They get about 58 kilograms, or 128 pounds, with 90 kilos, or 200 pounds, being the maximum uh, weight. And females typically weigh about 37.5, or about 83, kilogram, uh, 83 pounds on average. So that kind of implies that these guys are sexually dimorphic, and males typically being much larger and heavier than females. And um, they're actually black leopards in... Oh, hold on, that's kind of a meme. But um, really, really cool. In terms of their habitat, there's also the Zanzibar leopard, which is a population that lives on Zanzibar, or lived, or such lived. They're quite a bit smaller, and they have different rosettes, which is quite interesting. And um, there's also believed to be a population in northern... Uh, Africa, so this is the Barbary leopard, which has been evidenced by DNA, things like that, so they could very well be up there still. Really cool. So in terms of their uh, habitat and stuff, the African leopard lives in a wide variety of habitats within Africa. So they live from forests to savannas, only really not living in sandy deserts and things like that. But they used to occur across most of sub-Saharan Africa, occurring in both rainforests and deserts, and basically anywhere with enough rainfall that wasn't a desert they'd be living. And, but now they can be found in pretty much everywhere. They've also adapted quite well to the altered natural habitats and stuff uh, in the absence of intense persecution. So they often have been recorded in cities as well, but already in the 1980s they were rare throughout most of Africa. Now their pet distribution is patchy as well. And as I mentioned, they are rare in North Africa, with a relic population believed to persist in Morocco in the Atlas Mountains. And um, they're quite cold up there, so they seem to be doing all right there as well. And in terms of their behavior, in Kruger National Park, the uh, females, male and leopards with cuds, were typically um, 
most active at night than solitary females, and they tend to feed on things like impala, which we already covered as well. And they tend to eat, leopards are generally most active between sunrise and sunset, which is also quite interesting. Here's the male, we'll have a look at you. Uh, okay. In terms of diet and hunting, these guys have an excellent ability to uh, adapt to changes in prey, and have very broad tastes. They, um, they'll take small prey when large ungulates are common, and they've been known to eat from uh, dung beetles to adult elands, which can get up to 900 kilograms, as we mentioned. And in sub-Saharan Africa, there's at least 92 prey species that have been documented in leopard scat, which ranges from rodents to birds, and also large antelopes, hyraxes, hares, and therap um, arthropods, not theropods. Um, leopards generally focus their hunting around uh, locally abundant medium-sized ungulates, things like impala and cob and things like that. And they opportunistically will take other prey though. And usually intervals between their kills is about 7 to 14 days, I think so, 12 to 13 days. Uh, and they all often will hide large kills in trees, which uh, which requires great strength to do. But it allows them to hide their prey uh, that they've killed away from other predators. And they've even been seen hauling young giraffes, which can be up to about 125 kilograms, or about 276 pounds, up 5 meter tall trees. So that's quite interesting. In Serengeti, these guys were radio collared and studied. It seems these guys were really eating a lot, mostly of impalas and some gazelles, but they also ate warthogs, dick dicks, reed bucks, wildebeest, jackals, hares, guinea fowl, and things like that. But they were less successful hunting mongooses, harder beasts, plain zebras, giraffes, things like that. But they will pretty much eat what they will can find. And in North Africa, they also prey on macaques. And um, some places they'll feed on African buffaloes, red river hogs, and rats, and things like that, uh, which is quite interesting. And in Central Africa, they have been known to pursue large we um, Western lowland gorillas, but they didn't catch it. And gorilla parts have been found in leopard scat that implied that they either hunt gorillas or scavenge on gorillas. And they have been observed preying on adult eastern gorillas in some areas, though. But in terms of their behavior and stuff, they're not too different from other leopard uh, subspecies. Let's we'll look at the baby while we talk about their threats. Because throughout Africa, these guys do encounter threats, such as habitat conversion and intense prosecution, things like that. Uh, especially with um, they perceived and real livestock loss, uh, because these guys can hunt, will hunt live, livestock. And the upper Gideon forest in Liberia is considered a biodiversity hotspot, but it's actually been fragmented because of uh, logging and mining activities, and has been converted to oil plantations, things like that. Also, uh, trophy hunting has been unclear on their um, populations, and they may have had impacts on population level, especially when the females are shot. In Tanzania, only males are allowed to be hunted, but females actually consist about 30% of the 77 trophies sought in Tanzania between 1995 and 1998. And removing an excessively high number of males may perform a cascade of uh, bad effect to the population. Although um, male leopards do not provide any... Uh, uh, paternal care to the cubs the presence of a sigh allows females to raise club um, to, with the reduced risk of infanticide by other males and um, there are a few related observations of infanticide in leopards but new males even population will be more likely to eat cubs so taking too many males out can actually hurt the population because the, the presence of the other males kind of especially the father even if he's not directly taking part of the baby, will prevent other male leopards from coming into the female's ter territory and attacking her cubs so yeah, they are doing okay in most regards. They're still quite common across Africa, but uh, things like trophy hunting, things like that affect them. And they have been declining in some areas, as I mentioned, Patchy also in North Africa, they've declined in Zanzibar. They may be extinct there. And there's been lots of uh, analyses of leopard scats and tracking show that these guys have a high dietary overlap between uh, bush uh, meat hunters and leopards. So they're eating the same preys. And because of the increase in... Um, proximity to settlements and things like that they'll actually ex exploit smaller prey and have considerably reduced population densities compared to places far away from people and in the presence of intensive bushmeat hunting uh, leopards are pretty much entirely absent and um, the transhumanist uh, pastoralists on the border of sudan and south central africa will actually take their livestock stock to the area and they'll be in they are accompanied by armed merchants who engage in poaching large herbivores the sale of bushmeat and they trade leopard skins as well and surveys show that a leopard population decreased from about 97 individuals in 2012 to 50 uh, in 2017 in this area. And um, rangers have also confiscated a large amount of poison uh, from the camps of livestock herders who admitted to kind of poison the leopards to protect the livestock, which is kind of understandable. But in terms of their protection, they all are protected uh, in their range. 
They are considered a protected species. They live in protected areas. And hunting is banned, and it was actually suspended in South Af- 2016 in South Africa. So they are protected in a lot of areas where they occur. And they're still quite common, so that's another good thing. But um, yeah, a wonderful mod. Again, done by Havoc1199, Haruchu Ichinos, Good Boy, and Mega Gaming Rex. Really made a wonderful leopard. Really big fan of this guy, so really cool. So... I think this would be a great place to end the video. Thank you for everyone making these mods. It was nice to get like an African special. It almost feels like the stars aligned. So we got all these cool African animals in one episode. So yeah, this is going to be the second to last one before the next tropical pack. So um, yeah, really excited to look all through these with you guys. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified below anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye